Welcome along, fellow time travelers and strange historians. This time around, we're going to travel back in time to check out the fascinating story of Phineas Gage. You're going to see some really cool snaps and hear some really interesting information, some of which you may have never heard or seen before. Before I begin, please like and share the show and subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. Now please join me around the campfire. Phineas P. Gage was born in 1823 and died in 1860. He was an American railroad construction supervisor, famously known for miraculously surviving an incident where a large iron rod pierced entirely through his head, severely damaging the left frontal lobe of his brain. This catastrophic event had significant repercussions on his personality and behavior for the last 12 years of his life, leading to changes so drastic that his friends initially perceived him as being profoundly altered, to the point of not recognizing him as the same person. Born in Grafton County, New Hampshire, to Jesse Eaton Gage and Hannah Trussell Gage, Phineas was the eldest of five siblings. There was limited information about his early life and education, other than he was able to read and write. Remarkably healthy since childhood, Gage hardly suffered any illnesses. It is speculated that his initial experiences with explosives might have been in his youth, working either on farms or in nearby mines and quarries. By the age of 25, he stood 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighed 150 pounds, embodying the epitome of health, strength, and vitality. In July 1848, Phineas Gage found employment in the construction of the Hudson River Railroad near Cortland Town, New York. By September, he had risen to the position of blasting foreman on railway construction projects, earning a reputation as an exceptionally efficient and capable leader. He was known for being a savvy businessman, full of energy and relentless in achieving his operational goals. For his work, he had a special tamping iron made, a large iron rod designed for setting explosive charges. On the 13th of September, 1848, Gage was overseeing a work crew that was blasting rock to lay the foundation for the Rutland and Burlington Railroad tracks south of Cavendish, Vermont. The process of setting a blast involved drilling a deep hole into a rock outcrop, filling it with blasting powder and a fuse, and then packing the hole with sand, clay, or other inert materials using the tamping iron. This method was meant to contain the explosive force and direct it into the surrounding rock, facilitating the construction process. Around 4.30 p.m., while Gage was in the midst of his work, he was momentarily distracted by the activity of his crew behind him. Turning his head over his right shoulder to address them and inadvertently aligning his head with the blast hole and the tamping iron, Gage began to speak. At that moment, the tamping iron struck the rock creating a spark that ignited the powder, likely due to the absence of sand, which would normally have been packed into the hole. This ignition caused the tamping iron, which measured one and a quarter inches in diameter, three feet seven inches in length, and weighed 13 and a quarter pounds, to be propelled out of the hole. It entered Gage's face on the left side, traveling upward just in front of the jaw's angle. The rod continued its trajectory, moving outside the upper jaw, possibly breaking the cheekbone, passing behind the left eye, through the left side of the brain, and exiting completely through the top of the skull at the frontal bone. The end of the rod that penetrated Gage's cheek was pointed, tapering over 11 inches to end in a point that was a quarter inch in diameter. This unique tamping iron was custom made by a local blacksmith, and it was designed to meet Gage's specific preferences. The tamping iron plunged into the ground 80 feet distant, coated with blood and brain matter. Gage was knocked to the ground, experiencing brief involuntary movements of his arms and legs.
Shortly after he began speaking, managed to walk with minimal support, and sat up straight in an ox cart for the journey of three quarters of a mile to his accommodation in town. Roughly 30 minutes post-incident, Dr. Edward H. Williams encountered Gage seated outside the hotel, where Gage uttered a remarkably understated comment, saying, quote, Doctor, here is business enough for you, end quote. It was noted that Gage endured his ordeal with remarkable heroism. He immediately recognized Dr. Williams and expressed hope that his injuries were not severe. Despite his clear awareness, Gage's strength was waning due to the loss of blood. His body and the bed upon which he lay were entirely covered in blood. Moreover, Gage was ingesting his own blood, which he was forced to expel every 15 to 20 minutes. With William's help, Harlow prepared the area around where the tamping iron had exited by shaving Gage's scalp. He then cleared away clotted blood, small fragments of bone, and an ounce or more of brain matter that was protruding. Harlow searched for and removed any foreign objects before repositioning two large pieces of bone that had come loose. He then partially sealed the wound with adhesive strips to allow for drainage while keeping part of it open. The entry wound on Gage's cheek was only lightly bandaged to facilitate similar drainage. A damp dressing was applied, followed by a nightcap, and additional bandages were used to hold these in place. Harlow treated Gage's hands and forearms, which, like his face, had suffered severe burns and instructed that Gage's head be kept raised. By late evening, Harlow observed that Gage remained mentally clear though he experienced continued restlessness in his legs, which he moved back and forth. Gage informed the doctor that he had no desire to meet with his friends, believing he would return to work within a few days. He recognized his mother and uncle, who had journeyed from Lebanon, New Hampshire, a distance of 30 miles, to see him the morning after the incident. On the second day post-accident, it was reported that Gage began to lose his mental faculties as he became noticeably delirious. However, by the fourth day, Gage had regained his clarity of mind and was able to recognize his friends. A week after his recovery, Harlow began to entertain the possibility for the first time that Gage might actually recover. This sense of optimism and progress was, regrettably, short-lived. Starting from the twelfth day following the accident, Gage fell into a semi-comatose state, barely speaking unless addressed, and even then, only in single syllables. On the 13th day, Harlow observed Gage's declining strength. The left eye's globe became increasingly protruded with infected tissue referred to as fungus, rapidly emerging from the inner corner of the eye as well as from the brain injury protruding from the top of Gage's head. By the 14th day, the odors emitting from Gage's mouth and head were described as extremely foul. Gage was in a comatose state, responding only with single words when roused. He refrained from eating or drinking without significant encouragement. His friends, family, and caregivers awaited his death with each passing hour having prepared a coffin and garments for his burial. Meanwhile, Harlow removed the fungal growth sprouting from Gage's brain and the wound, applying crystalline silver nitrate liberally for its antiseptic properties and to aid in the removal of dead, damaged, and infected tissue, thereby enhancing the healing process of the surrounding healthy tissue. Using a scalpel, Harlow opened the frontalist muscle from the wound's exit point down to the top of the nose, resulting in the release of eight ounces of poor quality pus mixed with blood and emitting a horrendous odor. It is widely regarded that Gage was fortunate to have been under the care of Dr. Harlow. In 1848, few physicians would possess Harlow's experience in treating cerebral abscesses, an expertise that likely played a crucial role in saving Gage's life. On the 24th day post-accident, Gage managed to stand and take a step towards his chair, 
A month later, he was able to walk up and down stairs, around the house, and onto the porch. During a week, when Harlow was away, Gage ventured into the streets daily, except for Sundays, driven by an overwhelming urge to return to his family in New Hampshire. Despite his friend's advice, he went out without a warm coat and wearing thin boots, leading to wet feet and a cold. He soon developed a fever, but began to improve by mid-November, resuming his walks around the house. Gage seemed on the path to recovery. By the 25th of November, 10 weeks after the accident, Gage had regained enough strength to travel to his parents' home in Lebanon, New Hampshire, in a carriage that was typically used for transporting mental patients. Upon arrival, he was considerably weakened, but began to regain his strength and mental faculties by late December, even taking rides outside. By February, he was able to perform light chores around the farm, such as tending to the horses and feeding the cattle. As the plowing season approached in May or June, he could handle half a day's work without issue. By August, there was a slight impairment in his memory, subtle enough that it would not be apparent to someone who did not know him well. Roughly a year after the incident, Gage had donated his tamping iron to the Warren Anatomical Museum at Harvard Medical School, only to later retrieve it and thereafter refer to the iron as, quote, my iron bar, end quote, which became his steadfast companion for the rest of his life. In April 1849, Gage made a trip back to Cavendish, Vermont, and paid a visit to Harlow. During this visit, Harlow observed Gage had lost vision in his left eye and suffered from ptosis, which is a drooping of the eyelid, alongside a significant scar on his forehead, a remnant of Harlow's procedure to drain the abscess. Atop Gage's head was a visible, prominent, quadrangular bone fragment. Behind this fragment was a considerable depression, measuring two inches by one and a half inches, under which the pulsation of the brain was detectable. Harlow also noted the absence of Gage's rear left upper molar, located near the entry wound through the cheek. Gage experienced partial paralysis on the left side of his face. Despite being in good physical health otherwise, Harlow was confident in Gage's recovery. Gage reported no pain on his head, though he mentioned experiencing an indescribable odd sensation in that area. A year following the accident, Harlow noted that while some weakness persisted, Gage's physical recovery was largely complete. In November of 1849, Henry Jacob Bigelow, professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, took Gage to Boston for several weeks. After confirming that tamping iron had indeed traversed Gage's skull, Bigelow introduced him at a meeting of the Boston Society for Medical Improvement and likely to his medical students as well. Unable to resume his position on the railroad, Gage found employment as what could be described as a live exhibit at Barnum's American Museum in New York City. Phineas Gage's stint at Barnum's American Museum highlighted the period's captivation with medical curiosities and the resilience of the human spirit. Following his convalescence, Gage engaged in public appearances to sustain himself financially. His narrative captivated the public, not just for the ghastly details of his accident, but also for the dramatic shifts in his personality and behavior observed by acquaintances from before the incident. He showcased himself and the tamping iron, which had traversed his skull, effectively becoming a living display. He also spent around 18 months working for a stable and coach service owner in Hanover, New Hampshire. In August of 1852, Gage accepted an offer in Chile to become a long-distance stagecoach driver who would be responsible for the care of horses and to frequently pilot a heavy-loaded coach pulled by six horses across extensive routes. This job provided the routine structure Gage needed to rehabilitate lost social and personal skills, showcasing a recovery method that has since influenced how frontal lobe injuries are now treated. His duties in Chile required early mornings, self-preparation, and the care, feeding, and harnessing of horses. He needed to be punctual at the departure point, manage luggage and fares, ensure passengers were comfortably settled, 
and navigate the journey, including planning routes and responding swiftly to avoid traffic, wagons, and non-human animals. These responsibilities demanded foresight and impulse control. By mid-1859, Gage's health deteriorated, prompting him to travel to San Francisco in a weekend state after enduring significant difficulties in Chile, particularly in the last year that he was there. Upon arriving in San Francisco, he recuperated under the care of his mother and sister, who had moved there from New Hampshire when he had left for Chile. Eager to work, he quickly secured a job with a farmer in Santa Clara. In February of 1860, Gage started experiencing epileptic seizures, which led to the loss of his job. Despite the increasing frequency and severity of the seizures, he endeavored to work in various capacities, although his ability was significantly limited. On May 18, 1860, Phineas went to visit his mother. Early in the morning, on May 20, 1860, he experienced a severe seizure. The family doctor was summoned and resorted to bleeding him in an attempt to provide relief. The seizures continued frequently throughout the next day and night. Sadly, Phineas Gage succumbed to his condition on May 21, 1860. He was later laid to rest in Lone Mountain Cemetery in San Francisco, with his burial taking place shortly thereafter, although the exact date is not known. Years later, in 1866, upon discovering that Gage had passed away in California, Dr. Harlow reached out to Gage's family. Following Harlow's request, Gage's family exhumed his skull and personally transported it to Harlow, who had, by that time, become a well-known physician, businessman, and community leader in Woburn, Massachusetts. Additionally, Gage's family ensured that the tamping iron, closely associated with the infamous accident, was delivered to Dr. Harlow as well. Following his analysis for an 1868 paper reviewing Gage's case, Harlow returned the tamping iron and, this time, Gage's skull as well to the Warren Museum. They are still exhibited there to this day. The tamping iron carries an inscription authorized by Bigelow to accompany its initial placement in the museum. Although it incorrectly dates the accident by one day, it says as follows, quote, this is the bar that was shot through the head of Mr. Phineas P. Gage at Cavendish, Vermont, September 14, 1848. He fully recovered from the injury and deposited this bar in the Museum of the Medical College of Harvard University. Phineas P. Gage, Lebanon, Grafton City, New Hampshire, January 6, 1850. In 1940, as part of a citywide mandate to relocate cemeteries outside of San Francisco city limits, Gage's body, without his head of course, were reinterred at Cypress Lawn Memorial Park. So, what do you think of the story of Phineas Gage? Have you ever heard it before? What do you think about how incredible the human body is, and brain, to be able to endure that kind of trauma and for Phineas to be able to continue on with his life the way he had. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Finally, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell, because there will be more shows like this one, and I hope you check those out too. Please check out the links below to learn how to support my research and productions. Specifically, I'd really appreciate it if you could become a member of this channel and or join me on Patreon. You could also leave a super thanks in the comments below. Kindly be kind to all non-human animals, and please don't hurt them, and please don't eat them. They do not like that. Remember, for the benefit of compassion for all living things and their own health, brilliant people throughout history chose a plant-based diet. And please do yourself a favor and go to a local shelter 
and adopt a cat or a dog or both. You and they will be very glad that you did. Until next time, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys.